Hello and welcome to FACTS webinar, Restoring and Maintaining Riparian Areas in a Grazing System. Our guest presenter is Steve Gabriel. I am Samantha Gasson, FACTS Humane Farming Program Associate, and I will be moderating this, this session. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization headquartered in Illinois. We work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and helping consumers make informed food choices. My colleague Larissa and I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers across the country. We offer for grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorship, and of course, webinars on a variety of fabulous topics like this one. Please visit our website at foodanimalsconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. At this time, I am very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Steve Gabriel. Steve is an agroforestry extension agent for the Cornell Small Farms Program. He has also written several books about silver pasture. Along with his family, Steve operates Wellspring Forest Farm and School in the Finger Lake regions of New York. We are happy to have Steve with us today to share his experiences and expertise. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Steve so that he may begin his presentation. Steve, please. Please take it away. All right. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Very good. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. I'll just make one slight change to my bio because it's a recent change, which is I am no longer with the small farms program at Cornell. Um, I basically just uh, around March 1st transitioned to just working on the farm and doing uh, consulting for farmers around agroforestry and um and mushroom production, which are the two things I also worked at, at the university. So still Very doing cool. the work, just doing it in a different capacity. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and um, share uh, on an important topic that I'm also actively learning about because it's something that continues to be an issue at our farm. And uh, so I hope to provide some overview of, of riparian uh, planning and buffers and where you can get uh, support and assistance and what that could look like for you. Um, there's a lot of questions in the water realm, I find. There's a lot of questions in <laughs> many realms uh, as I've done these back <laughs> webinars, but uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can. And um, and I encourage folks who are here that also might have experience or expertise to, to help answer those questions or provide you know links or resources as well, because we're all, we're all learning this uh, together here. So let me just share my slides. Okay, so... Um, it is not a coincidence that uh, our farm's name is Wellspring. Um, it, we do call ourselves a forest farm. Uh, the reason we call ourselves that is because we sort of our values based mission is to farm in the image of a forest or or sometimes we say leave a forest in our footsteps so that when we're uh, long gone, that's what's behind as opposed to the rather uh, abused kind of dilapidated set of fields and, and forests that we found ourselves uh, landing in uh, back in 2010 was the first time we stepped stepped on this land and so we're just getting into our 12th growing season um, we do grow uh, mushrooms as our main cash crop I would say uh, uh, both indoor and outdoor systems um, we do a lot with agroforestry including our grazing system with sheep we've also had ducks and chickens and uh, different poultry at, at different times. Uh, right now, just doing mainly a, a pastured chicken operation for kind of our own personal consumption, mostly. Um, but silvo pasture is really important. Riparian buffers, which is what we'll focus on today. Forest farming really is where the mushrooms and maple syrup and things like that come in. Um, we also grow trees. Uh, we grow and sell trees. Um, we teach other folks about uh, working with agroforestry, working with trees on their farm, seeing the value of those and thinking about the ways those integrate with productive farm systems. Um, and that's really the premise of a lot of what I want to talk about, which is that um, water management, conservation, trees do not have to be at odds with farm production. That's a huge motivation for me um, as I've uh, farmed over the last 20 plus years. And um, I, I see a lot of folks interested and excited about it. I still see the uh, agencies around us that can offer support often lagging a bit in terms of being able to provide technical assistance and support in the ways that that can work. But um, we have a legacy in the U.S. of 
of saying there's there's fields and there's forests and there's water somewhere. What's productive is tillable fields. <laughs> and as we know, as grazers, um, uh, pasture pasture based uh, operations are 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 really viable as well and really important and valuable because when we remove tillage, we we put our land in permanent pasture and that can be really beneficial for a lot of reasons. But I'm then saying, let's add the trees back in. And there's a, there's a growing number of us advocating for that and helping folks figure out the, the details of how to get there. So those are the things we, we mainly do at our farm. We do a lot of production. We do also do education. And we have a couple, like a yurt and a cabin that we also rent out on Airbnb. So if you're ever in the central New York Mecklenburg area, the beautiful Finger Lakes region, uh, come visit us and, and check out the farm. Um, uh, is in a bigger, longer sense of things, we are on the traditional lands of the Gai Okono, the Cayugan Nation. Uh, we are in a, a really amazing uh, place of what is now called New York State, but for thousands of years was stewarded by, by indigenous communities. And I bring this up uh, partially in, in relation to today because water is something that I have learned a lot about uh, from folks of the Gai Okono Nation. And specifically in learning and building relationships with those folks, um, learning some of the language, understanding the importance and the value that is, is placed on water, that it is, it is one of the most sacred elements that we could have and that we want to treat it in uh, a deeper sort of relational way than just as a, as a resource um, to be contained or not contained or, or used or not used. It's something uh, really valuable, really important. That's something that in the next coming decades is going to become absolutely instrumental to the ways that our, our communities survive and thrive. And uh, that that's going to be too much water, too little water and everything in between. And so, um, so I bring that to you. And um, one of the Gai Okono folks I'm in contact with stressed that anyone on, on those lands, one of the best things they could do to honor the the traditions and the sort of lineage of um, of their stewardship was to continue to steward the land and especially the waters, keep the waters clean, keep the waters flowing. And we're blessed to have lots of fresh water here that flows into the Finger Lakes and flows northward into Lake Ontario and out, out the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway. Um, so I bring that in and I, I want to you know start with that because uh, our perception and the way that we perceive water, and I ha have a lot of folks contact me or I hear just sort of um, complaining about these different water issues uh, that can be really frustrating. That's that's very valid, but um, we always want to turn, I think, that our minds back to the idea that water is an asset, is something really beneficial in the landscape. It just may not be um, flowing sometimes in the right place at the right time, or it may not be channeled or focused in a way that supports our production aims and also supports sort of the greater ecological health of the landscape. And 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 all too often, that's because of the ways we've treated landscape in the recent past um, and the ways that our surrounding neighbors may treat the landscape. So our farm has to deal with the water issues that that flow through the landscape. And some of those we can address and some of those we have to take uh, with a grain of salt in a sense because we can't fully quote unquote fix the entire watershed. So the choices of our neighbors up the hill um, have a big effect on what we can do. Um, but we can still do quite a bit. It's lifetimes of work uh, working with water in the landscape here. Um, this is a, a, ser a series of maps showing um, on, the, on the left side, a, a lower emission scenario and a higher emission scenario. So when we look at the effects of climate change, the projections for an increase in heavy extreme rain events is quite significant for most regions of the country, um, less so in the desert Southwest and South, um, and even the Pacific Northwest, but certainly when we look at the Midwest and the Northeast US um, in particular, uh, quite an increase in the intensity and the duration of rain events. And so if we already see the effects of, of heavy rainfall in our landscape, those effects are probably only going to persist if not get uh, more intense. And so so our work in riparian areas is, is really critical and, and, and important to be thinking about and to be planning ahead for um, as we go through. So, so what is a riparian zone? What we're going to focus on today is, oops, sorry, specifically um, what is what is known as along the water's edge or the area that is the interface between land and, we'll just say land and water. D uh, the, traditionally, we think of rivers and streams. It could really be any sort of scale that you might be thinking of. And it would also, I, in my mind, include wetlands um, and areas where, where water is saturated into the soil um, or other features that we might bring into our landscape. And so, Often we've restricted those waterways to a very narrow channel or a very um, 
thin habitat and and that's caused a lot of issues and and that might be persistent uh, to the point where it's affecting um, the the land-based systems that we're trying to implement on our farms so it's not just the what where the water is itself it's this entire ecosystem that includes the water course up to what we call the bank fill zone um, which is if you imagine uh, that streams and water courses will rise and fall uh, over time, uh, what it, where are the banks of that? And uh, wh wh what's the water sort of at its high watermark would be our bankful zone. And then beyond that, if we have an overflow effect, it goes into what we would call the floodplain. So we include those two elements as part of our riparian area, but we also want to expand and look beyond into what we would call the uplands um, and, and the potential there to catch and, and store water and put it into the soil far before it even gets into what we would call the floodplain or the, or the, the, the sort of um, the water course itself. And so are there ways that we can, we can reduce sort of the impact all the way starting at the top of the hill and working our way down? And that's something that we've been working with at our farm and have seen some really good effects of. Um, so of course, the sort of unrestricted access of livestock, because we're talking in, in the context of livestock management in waterways. Um, it can be idyllic in one sense. It's really nice to have let the animals give sort of natural free access. But the challenge with that is, um, is the repeated impact that that can have on that ecosystem uh, from uh, the, 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 the range of effects of, you know, bank erosion to uh, nutrient overloading of the waterways, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, compaction of, of soils, um, all sorts of things that could happen, right? So, so this is not um, the scenario we want to create. What we want to think of, though, is not just animals in or out, but how they interface and interact and what are the ways that we understand these different zones and, and how our livestock can interact or not interact with them over time. So um, riparian buffers is a term that um, you'll see again. Sometimes it's um, they're called conservation buffers. And I sometimes joke that this is the problem child of agroforestry. So agroforestry being the combination of um, trees and, and farming uh, practices, we have alley cropping, which would be growing rows of trees and doing uh, hay or annual production in between or even grazing. Although if we did grazing in between rows of trees, we'd probably call that silvopasture. We have um, windbreaks as a agroforestry practice. We have far forest farming, which is utilizing the forest canopy for different cropping systems. And then we have this riparian buffer thing. And I always joke that it's kind of the problem child of agroforestry because all the other practices really um, harp on, wow, this is a really productive ecosystem, really beneficial for your production on the farm. And, um, and it's good for, for sort of wildlife and ecosystem services. And riparian buffers are often framed as, well, you're going to have to, you know, sacrifice some of your land for this conservation, this important thing, but, um, but it's really important and you should do it. And no more, nowhere has this had been more evident in my experience than when I traveled to Iowa many years ago for an agroforestry conference. And just to hear the researching that was that was happening there about productive riparian buffers and, and all the wonderful benefits they have, and also hearing from farmers and sort of the reluctance to adopt buffers as a practice, really common was to see contracts where farmers would be paid to put their landscapes into buffers for 10 or 15 years. And as soon as those contracts were up, they would they would rip out the buffers and put corner soy right back into the waterway. So that to me is not an issue with the farmers. It's actually an issue with the way that policy and and um, and the programs themselves are are laid out and and the ways that we we think about a conservation versus a production space. So this kind of dichotomy is really, I think, problematic. And what we want to seek in agroforestry are ways to find synergy. So I want everyone here to think about if I'm if I'm working with waterways on my farm, what are the ways that I can see productive value in that space that can be um, hand in hand with my production goals, not that one opposes the other, because this this diagram is sort of saying, well, you kind of, you know, in more, one case or another kind of have to either trade off uh, water quality or, or agricultural production, except in this one scenario, which is which is a bit oversimplified in that sense. So you know, we're looking for solutions where we can find the overlap of, of what the landscape needs, so to speak, and what what the farmer is is after as well. And so we really need to be thinking about it. And I'm excited that there's a larger, larger sort of group of folks working on that and thinking about that. So um, we often think about the benefits and, and sort of what healthy riparian habitats occupy in, in terms of different zones. You'll see a lot of pictures if you start looking into riparian information that have these kind of different zones working out from the banks of 
that waterway out uh, into the, the productive uh, pasture, so to speak, or the productive fields. Um, so this is a gradient where you have different opportunities um, to work on. So for instance, in this diagram here, <clears throat> excuse me, like section two is talking about um, the benefits of trees shading a stream that has a lot of benefits for aquatic uh, vertebrates, um, as well as for maintaining good, um, good water quality. And obviously that, that benefit is not going to be realized unless the trees are, are close enough to the bank so that they're actually shading the, the water, right? And of course, it depends also the direction that the stream is flowing and the aspect of the slope and the direction of the slope and the steepness of the slope. So even this is a bit oversimplified, but we can think about the benefits as kind of rippling out and having a, a different um, layers of effects. Um, what we ultimately want to do with good, healthy riparian zones is put shade onto waterways to support cooler, generally like cooler stream environments. And this is gonna be um, ever more critical, again, as we, we see the results of changing climate. Uh, we wanna have woody debris and, and habitat in streams in order to be functional and healthy. We wanna have bank stability. That's probably the most important from a, a grazing perspective and, and thinking about that in a long-term way. And we wanna plan for floods and we wanna be filtering out nutrients and pollutants runoff uh, from our potential you know, operations as we go. So one really simple way to think about this, this is really true for water in general. And I just want to mention, I did do a water webinar, uh, sort of more broadly talking about water on the farm several years ago with fact. And I'll put the link in the chat for, um, for the page of that webinar and some of the other ones I've done, it's just called Water Management for Pasture Grazing. But we talked about this idea that often design for water starts with this idea. Well, water comes in somewhere, it leaves somewhere. We call the entry point a source and the exit point a sink. And then often our solutions are almost like drawing a straight line between the source and the sink, and that can often cause issues. And what we see time and time again is that the more we can meander, pause, slow down, spread out the impact of water throughout our landscape, the better off we're going to be. So that's a really good image to hold in your head. When we think about riparian areas, a couple kind of big concepts I want to throw out and have you all think about. One would be, um, where are you in the larger watershed? So our farm is actually at the top of our Taganic Creek watershed, which flows um, all the way down the valley, the main valley and over Taganic Falls, which goes into Lake Cayuga. We're at the top of that. And so buffers and things that we do actually have more impact because they're going to ripple downstream uh, through this effort. Your landscape may be a microcosm of this watershed. You might actually have quite a bit of watershed to work with. And again, really gauging like, what can I do? Where do I sit in this watershed? And what can I do? And what can't I do? I can't affect the volume of water. It'd be nice to slow down the water that is, is impacting us from our neighbors and, and, and from decisions that the local town has made. In particular, they installed a rather dramatically large culvert and then directed all the ditches to it. So that's coming onto our land. I can't change that. Um, unless I want to run for town government and probably do a lot of things. Um, but I can work with the fact that there's going to be a high volume of water on our landscape, right? But the effects I have are going to ripple downstream and, and have benefits to the folks below me. So um, in addition to uh, thinking about the position in a watershed, we also want to understand that, that um, streams and waterways are living and breathing and moving all the time. They're constantly eroding banks and depositing those and moving them. And this, this diagram is a bit extreme in terms of, I've been on, I've canoed on uh, waterways like this in the Adirondacks, uh, really fun to do. Um, not something we have on our farm in terms of this kind of meander, but really to show that that constant pattern. And so there is actually a band that the, the, the waterway sort of has, in my mind, a right to in terms of how it's gonna transition and change um, course over time. And that's just a natural process of, of water flowing through the landscape. And in fact, that's called something, it's called a meander belt. Uh, and there was some great research done to show the uh, what we should understand in terms of what a meander belt is and how much we should be giving uh, a water course space in order to flow over time. So if we think about the channel of water itself, now, caveat with this is there's always variability and it's very site specific and context specific. So the, um, the soil you have, the slope you have, the, uh, so many different variables will affect um, what we're talking about here. But these general concepts really apply and they're often things you can bring to someone who's helping you with planning or with funding. Hopefully you're more understanding of what they're talking about and able to 
you know, potentially apply those things. That's where it's helped me in communicating with some of our agencies about what we're looking for in terms of, you know, water management support on the farm. But anyway, uh, when we look at these meander belts, what we're looking at is uh, taking the, the width of the channel of water that's actually moving, and then basically uh, giving it about six times that width if we drew, were to draw a line bisecting this, essentially the, the average width of this channel. And again, it's very simplified on here because you just have this nice little even kind of flow. It can be, get a bit more funky to actually map out onto a landscape, but it's something I have helped folks look at. Well, what is the, the waterway that we're expecting? What is the that meander belt that we want to think about as part of our um, ultimate breadth that the river or the, the waterway, I should say, could have. We don't have any rivers. We're mostly dealing with seasonal streams on our farm. So that meander is going to be within what we call this larger sense of the floodplain. Again, there's the bank fill, which is always where is that channel filling and that 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 bank fill is going to me meander over time, but then it's also going to potentially flood over time and overflow into the floodplain. And the way we can understand floodplain is that we can take that uh, bank fill depth uh, and multiply it by two. And that's that's a good starting point for what our floodplain width might be. Now that's a little <clears throat> simplified because again, it depends a lot on the surrounding topography. So if you imagine like a uh, waterway cutting through a really tight gorge, your floodplain is gonna be very different of course than if you have a very wide flat zone like you can see here um, in the images above. So. That may, may or may not always apply, but in general, that's a starting point because you can say, well, two, two times the, the depth of that full capacity would be a space to think about as, as potentially the floodplain. There are ways to map floodplains and to look at that. Again, some of the resource professionals that we'll talk about at the end of the talk here might, might be of help in that. And then the last thing I want to just throw out as a, as a really important concept is um, we're not just talking about a single meandering thing. When we look at natural water flows, they're always changing and they're always doing really cool, creative uh, patterns in the landscape where water um, might sit for a really long time. It might um, get caught up in a bit of an eddy or a bit of an oxbow, um, might have a little bit of a, almost like a lake or a side pond in it, again, depending on scale, things like that. And then it's, it's, it's uh, on our farm, our water's mostly, because we're such a hilly, hilly space here, we're, we're, they're flowing down through relatively narrow spaces, but I recognize that other parts of you all may be tuning in from, you might have quite wide valleys and you may be grazing right up through these spaces. And so one of the challenges is to figure out what is the interface of your rotational grazing plan with these kind of um, ecosystems. But to just put it out there for now, these are natural processes, these are natural parts of it, and we want to design and be flexible in that sense. And what it means is that any paddocks in the floodplain, whether we um, completely exclude our animals, which can happen in some cases, or we have flash grazing or some small instances of grazing, those paddocks are probably going to change over time. And they're realistically going to not always be utilized every time in the same way that something on an upland slope might have. So you have to be flexible and sort of dynamic with the nature of how grazing happens in these zones. So <clears throat> if we look at this, there are options for grazing. This is kind of a, a simple list. So we could have unrestricted access to these riparian zones, and that we've already mentioned is not a good idea. We want to be controlled just in the same way that rotational grazing has many, many benefits um, and, and is a really critical practice for good pasture management, as is, you know, Letting animal, giving animals access, but also uh, excluding them from areas uh, based on what's going on at that given time. And that's really going to depend uh, seasonally or even within a season. So flash grazing can be really great if the animals are nearby at the right time and you can get them in there for a short duration and have an impact that can be really beneficial. But you can't necessarily plan on it because the right time when stuff is dried out or the conditions are right, the animals may be on the other side of the ranch or the farm. And so it may not be practical to do that. So there's some interesting you know, considerations there, but when you can take opportunity for that, um, we had a drought last year and that was a great opportunity to put the sheep in some areas they hadn't been in in a few years and actually have the effect of their trampoline and, um, and some of their eating and some of the things that we did in there really um, uh, shift the composition of that ecosystem. And then they won't be in there for a few more years, more likely than not. Um, I'd say that generally, uh, in, in any agency you're going to work with is definitely going to uh, want you to fence out or exclude animals from what we would call the bank zone. So again, bank full just discharge. That's that highest point of there. That's the 
uh, edge of the, the waterway that's most critical to falling into the water, essentially. So that, that edge is going to want to be fenced, whether that's permanent fence or temporary fence. We just use temporary fence right now. We're hoping to get an NRCS contract and put permanent fence along the bank zone. They sometimes have requirements for going further than that into the overbank zone or the floodplain, as we might want to call it. So you could fence along just that bank zone or potentially fence along the overbank zone. That's that's up to you ultimately. No one can tell you to do that or not. Um, if you want to get an NRCS contract or or something from your county or state, they might have a requirement for what that distance is or what that setback is. And ideally, that's based on the specific ecology of your landscape, not on some generic number, because it's going to vary depending on the circumstances. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then, of course, we could just fence the whole thing off. We Sometimes it's you just put a fence in the what we call the transitional zone upland or somewhere in there and just say uh, no access at all. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of that. I'd like to keep my animals away from the bank zone, but I would like to have access to the floodplain to um, to do some managed grazing for, for benefit. So that's kind of the strategy that we've taken. So again, as you develop your pasture plan and you have a, a paddock map, not all of these paddocks are are equal in the sense of they're always going to get grazed at the same duration, the same intensity. Um, and all the ones in here, uh, you can see um, in green are conservation area. We call it conservation areas, but they don't actually make it into our, our standard grazing plan. They're sort of bonuses that we could add in, but we still plan the number of animals, the rotation, the rest periods on the paddocks that we know we can count on. And anything in a riparian area is sort of icing on the cake, so to speak. Um, you don't want to set it yourself up and get overstocked to the point where you're you're having to put animals into those zones, whether that's you know, debatable in terms of is it good for the animals, is it good for the riparian zone, something like that. And if you're interested, uh, the last webinar I did was Rotational Grazing 101. We talk about calculating uh, carrying capacity for animals and paddock sizes and things like that. So rotational grazing and this stuff go hand in hand. And we want to really think about our riparian zones, I think, as like I say, the icing on the cake instead of the cake itself. Um, I think for water access for animals, uh, it's very desirable to just like let them go into the water in a sense, but it can be really tricky to manage that. So it's really best to think about ideally systems where you can get the water out and bring it up on the shore, so to speak, or up on the hill and 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 feed it to the animals, right? Give it to them um, in a tank or something like that, even if it's a portable uh, system. So we we pump our water from, from one of our ponds, we put it in a tank on a trailer and we just haul that around with the animals and um, and that works good, much better than giving them access to the pond. It wouldn't be worth the, the negative consequences. Um, this is an NRCS picture where they do give access to a river through these kind of gate systems. So if you do wanna give access, um, sometimes again, programs will allow that. Obviously this is your choice, um, but again, if you en enroll in, in, in uh, different, uh, programs. They may have restrictions on that. You just want to have it in a really con concentrated and managed area that you can pay attention to and consider when or when, 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 uh, when or when not, when, when or when you would not uh, uh, give animals access to this, uh, this type of, of water, right, as we go. Um, uh, there's <laughs> clear designs for, again, fencing out um, that uh, buffer area and then also offer uh, figuring out livestock crossings. And so there's lots of resources out there about how to design livestock crossings, usually allowing the water to spread out, um, compacting gravel or stone and creating a really compacted waterway that animals can make their way across. This is not a, a design for them to necessarily um, uh, consume water from, but actually to cross waterways because that can be really important. And there is, uh, there is federal funding to install these things, which is which I'll talk about, which is really valuable. So it's good to think about these things and, and plan for them. And if there is going to be interface, you may only be able to access part of your pasture because uh, through a waterway um, to plan for that and to give, to figure out the right spots to let them cross and, and to actually design and engineer that so that um, you're minimizing impact on the stream. So talk a little bit about our, you know, our farm process here. Um, we spent a lot of time just doing observation, walking around uh, rainy years and rainy times when the rain is pouring down is a really valuable time to actually, you know, go out in the landscape and see what water is doing uh, or just after a heavy rainfall if you don't want to get wet um, and really get a sense of how water's moving, um, where your micro watersheds are within your landscape and 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 start to really map it out. That, that at least helps me. I, I like to use... Um, 
Google Earth a lot. Uh, free software, easy to draw on, easy to keep records on, that sort of thing. But any type of record keeping is fine. But you can see here just one of our water maps where we uh, looked at the ditches and the, um, the riparian areas that were intentional and not intentional. And we just started to sort of map things out. And this was the basis for us to then identify what types of solutions we could see to improve issues. So so our main issue with the larger pond is, is silting in that pond because there's basically unrestricted flow from uh, a, a poorly poorly functioning wetland down to the pond, sort of in the middle here. So this, this wetland restoration and, and sort of into here was for at least several decades, um, not well planned, not well done. And so, uh, yeah, so everything's just sort of dumping into there. Um, and then we have this other uh, riparian area down at the bottom of the landscape that essentially we have some access to. It's unfortunate the boundary cuts off some of our access, but then we have sort of a gullying effect here where because of all the excess water that's collecting and then the, the sudden drop in elevation, we have uh, quite a gullying effect. And this is actually eating away our pasture um, just to the ups, upslope side of this uh, over time. And so that's, that's something we're working on. Uh, so we'll talk a little more about that. So. I mentioned, you know, this has got to be based in in value, like what value you find. So, you know, my wife and I brainstormed and thought about what are the reasons we want to do this water management? It's going to be an investment one way or the other, whether we're buying stone and gravel and culverts or renting excavators or hiring someone else to do it or yada, yada, yada. So what are the ways that, you know, putting energy into these systems is going to make sense for us? What do we want out of this in a sense? If we don't have a motivation for it. It's going to be really hard to um, find the time to really pay attention to it. And then you're going to like uh, really get into the muck, so to speak, um, when you get these flooding events. You know, when we have three or four inch rain events, um, we see the benefit of the efforts we've put in and we see where we are falling short very quickly, right? Um, we didn't have any of those rain events last year, but um, two years ago we had three or four of them and it was it was significant. So we had a record drought, type of year last year and then record wet the year before. And I expect that to probably be the same. So articulate your goals, think about the reasons that you want to you want to make this work for you. So the first step always for us has been to build soil capacity because no matter where your pastures are, whether they're in a floodplain, whether they're on the uplands, whether they're at the tops of those slopes, you can increase soil organic matter and you can increase water holding capacity. And that is only going to benefit your grazing system. So rotational grazing alone does that. There's lots of other great webinars, resources on ways to improve pasture quality, Im improve soil quality. That's always going to be, for the dollars invested, the best bang for your buck for storing water and reducing the impacts, you know, literally downstream in this case. And then from there, we're going to move down the slope. So upland buffers, um, including swales, which I'm going to talk about, Brian, I uh, see your question in the chat. Have been really important. So when we think about um, the landscape profile, this could be just uh, just your farm, or it could be your farm is part of this larger pattern. But the bottomlands is really where we get into riparian zones, and so, to some case, lower slopes. You may have your floodplain kind of backing into your lower slopes, then you have your upper slopes, and you have your uplands that are catching the water as it runs downhill. And the upper slopes are the ones that bubble out. <clears throat> They're uh, convex versus the lower slopes are concave. You may have heard of like key line design and key line planning. It pays attention to certain points within that transition from uh, con, uh, convex to concave slopes, upper slopes to lower slopes. But the important thing to understand is if it's got a hump, it's more prone to erosion. And that should really be uh, a really important part to prevent erosion that's going to be impacted downhill. You can do a lot more up here in the uplands to reduce your issues down in the bottomlands. So for us um, in those areas, swales have been really valuable. So you can see here, what we did is we, with a laser level, you can see that in the picture there, we marked a contour line, which is a line of uh, equal elevation. Um, and in this case, they had a slight drop. So we did uh, about one inch drop every 50 to 75 feet. And we would paint that line out and then dig it with the excavator. And so we're, we're excavating a ditch and then we're making a mound. And this is again, across the hillside. So anywhere that water is concentrated, if it hits the swale, it's gonna spread out evenly across the entire length of that swale, which in this case was uh, close to 300 feet. 
And we have another swale that's actually just upslope from this as well. So we put two slopes on this up, uh, this upper crest of the hillside. Um, and we excavated. So uh, I really like Br Brad Lancaster is a really good um, uh, resource. Uh, I think it's just rainwaterharvesting.com, but I'll put his name in here. His volume two is about earth, uh, earthworks for uh, water catchment, really phenomenal resource. That's how we did our calculations to figure out how big to make our swales, how long to make our swales, that sort of thing. Um, so we dug these swales uh, after digging them. It's important. You're going to have to do some finish work by hand inevitably. So what we have is some folks helping us smooth out the base, make sure it's, it's at the right grade and then putting that material in the berm. And then we pounded in a bunch of willow stakes, cheapest, easiest thing to do. I'll share a little more about willow. Here's the finished swale planted up with some cover crop and some initial trees after a four inch rain event where all of that water, which again is not coming uniformly across this hill, but it is hitting this swale and spreading out evenly. This swale is filled to capacity at this point. It's important to have an overflow plan. You can see at the bottom here, this is almost leaking out onto what we have as a little farm road here, but uh, we have an overflow at the other end of this that was actually draining, but this was after a major rain event and all that water was sitting there for about a week, soaking into the soil, soaking into the, the, the berm and into the hillside versus just washing down all in that four inch rain event. When we got on the farm, there were gullies everywhere. This was contributing heavily and we were just reduced that impact on that uh, creek that we still have to work with, which is at the, the bottom of this hill. So great strategy for upland uh, work in terms of water harvesting or water redirecting. Here's the willow after a few years. It also proved to be very valuable as a snow fence, as well as uh, a fodder, uh, crop for our sheep, which I'll touch upon briefly. Another riparian area I mentioned is, is feeding this larger pond that we have and a wetland that is uh, hopefully going to be in, in a restoration process over the next three or four years. We've been trying to work on that with NRCS because it's a bigger project than we know how to handle. Um, but essentially a lot of the surrounding landscape sort of slowly drains into this wetland, which is sort of clogged up with soil and vegetation. So it doesn't actually hold that much water. That overflows and then, like I said, makes its way down to the pond without a lot of obstruction, a lot of objection. And so it's carrying a bunch of silt with it in these heavy rain events, and that's dumping right into our, our large pond. And once it's in the pond, it's pretty hard to get out. So what we're trying to do is keep that silt out, use, it, uh, use this riparian area for cropping. So we figure if animals are going to be more or less excluded, why not have another productive crop in there? And so there's some really valuable, uh, interesting agroforestry crops we're excited about we've introduced in there. We do keep some of that uh, floodplain open as a quote unquote corridor because it actually connects um, some of our open field pastures with some of our civil pastures up in the woods. So we did wanna make sure that we plan for having animals to come through there, but, but in a smaller kind of a strip, I guess. And then we plant some other species as well. So here's some examples like this is just before the pond, before we did anything. We started digging some of these um, potholes or small settling pools all the way up um, for, for hundreds and, and thousands of feet to settle these. And we planted these. Unfortunately, I don't have the after picture uh, handy right now, but we planted these all up with willow as well. And they do a great job of, of stopping and holding. And we designed them so that someone could come through with an excavator and scoop the silt out and actually harvest that and continue to, continue to clean them out. So this is not a, a practice where you just do it once and you don't have to think about it again. We designed this knowing that silt is going to have to settle somewhere, but let's settle it before this pond and let's harvest it. And we actually use that, you know, to feed our fruit trees and, and other, other plantings and things like that. Um, upslope from that riparian area, you can see what we started with was literally a thicket. So one of the th reasons this wasn't working well is there was so much overgrown brush because this farm had been really neglected and abandoned for a long time. But we didn't even know what was going on. The water was just sort of banging up against different trees and shrubs and just sort of trying to make its way down. So we had to open up and remove some of that vegetation. And even though I said before that shading a waterway is a good idea, um, too much shade or too much of a thick overstory is actually um, just as negative. So there's a balance uh, to strike um, in that. And then we started digging larger settling pools as well that have become incredible uh, frog and salamander habitats over time. So here's one that we dug. And this is a really good example. We originally had dug this settling pool again with a laneway for the sheep to be able to get through um, just to move up into the woods, not to graze here or to stay here, just to be on their merry way. 
Um, when we originally dug this, you can kind of see that the overflow of this uh, settling area was going this way, but the the waterway said, uh, uh, we're actually going to meander over here and and actually come in this way, which actually ultimately is a much better path. It's a lot less erosive to go kind of around these trees and this is a much subtler way to enter. So this is an active streamway and is constantly carving itself new directions. This is now dried up and this is now active. And since then it's actually moved further out. So again, when I say that meander belt, you take that channel and you really have to think much wider as, as far as what your riparian area uh, can look like. Here's just another shot. And here's some of the plantings that we're doing again along that bank zone where we're always gonna exclude our animals. So our fencing is gonna go right along those stakes on the outside in this case, temporary fencing, net fencing. Um, and we're going to plant that bank up really densely in order to hold that soil in place so that the, the water can move but not take too much with it as it goes. And then finally, <coughs> I think um, the big hanging carrot for us all to spend more time with riparian areas is the, the benefit of multifunctional vegetation. So this is some willow that was... Um, uh, if you can kind of see out through the willow, this is Prince Edward, Edward Island Sound. Prince Edward Island is up in Canada. It is known for its mussels and its uh, seafood in general. And there was a lot of concern because on the main island, there's a lot of farming uh, tillage, especially potatoes being grown and a lot of fertilizer application that was running off from those upland potato fields down into um, and into the bay in this case. Uh, what they were experimenting with was uh, growing this willow as a buffer and then uh, harvesting the willow on a rotation and seeing if they could still get the, the willow to effectively uptake uh, fertilizer so that it didn't go into the bay and also that they could still harvest the willow. In this case, they chipped it and used it in a digester for electricity generation. So pretty cool. The, har the farm was essentially harvesting its uh, excess fertilizer off its fields, turning it into woody biomass, turning that back into less electricity that was powering the, the farm. So pretty remarkable in that sense. Working really well. So willow is amazing because it's able to actually partition nitrogen into a lot of shoot growth. So you get a lot more biomass and then partitions the phosphorus into root growth. And uh, we, there are students there digging up the root masses and showing us just this incredibly ropey, thick, dense root systems that were harvesting this material. So um, one of my favorites is willow and there's many different species of willow to work with. And it has just such a laundry list of benefits and it's so easy to start and plant and work with in, in these, especially in these riparian systems. So, so again, we wanna think about matching our vegetation with the areas of our, uh, our, of our of our riparian zone. Not everybody wants to be hanging out on the bank and not everybody wants to be up on the upland. And some can swing all the way through and some have very particular niches uh, to pay attention to. You'll see a lot of tables uh, with NRCS and sort of other publications. I think that's great um, as long as they're trees you are interested in and have a, have a vested purpose in. And, and when you say elderberry, that's fine, but um, if it's not a, a selected cultivar or something that has known uh, productive capacity, it may not be worth you actually harvesting it. So um, important to pay attention to those things. And, and there are more and more resources about what I've, what I've seen mostly as multifunctional riparian buffers, which is where we start to think about in, in introducing cropping systems into, into buffer plantings. Now, some programs that you might enroll in don't always allow you to harvest from those uh, buffers. So you have to be uh, read the fine print in that sense and understand and not all uh, things, because they might have some economic value, do have economic value. Um, it all depends on, of course, building markets around these things. So we're currently uh, expanding and continuing to work with elderberries, a really exciting one. Um, I love all these other plants, but it's not something from our perspective in, in New York right now that have a huge market value. Um, if we were a little bit warmer, a little bit further south, I would definitely think about pawpaws as a really good floodplain uh, tree. Uh, it's a little too cold here to get really good production. We have a few pawpaws just for our own consumption, but in terms of scaling, it doesn't make as much sense than if I was down in like Virginia or Missouri or something like that. So I've already mentioned willow in addition to its amazing ability to work with filtering nutrients. Um, it's an amazing fodder for, for livestock. Um, and I, I did cover that pretty uh, thoroughly in, in the fodder webinar I did uh, for fact, which again, uh, we've linked before. 
You can also harvest pole wood and use it for live staking. Uh, there's a whole field of study called soil bioengineering, really fascinating ways to use willow and other uh, fast growing plant materials. So one of the things is these fascines, which you can actually bundle willow together and dig that into the hillside. And then it will act as a physical uh, erosion control mechanism as well as sprout and grow and become a living erosion control mechanism. Super cool stuff. Sure. We love it for fodder. So when we think about it in a riparian zone, we're not giving it uh, to the animals like in situ, like go at it, you know, and that's actually good for fodder. We don't always want to have our animals have unrestricted access because they'll probably probably overdo it. <laughs> so we think about what we call a cut and carry system or ideally a toss over the fence system where again, that fence that's keeping the animals away from the bank is also excluding them from our crops. And we can go in there, just hop over the fence real easy with our pruners, lop, 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 throw some willow over to them. They're happy, we're happy, and the creek's happy, you know, all at the same time. So we've talked about uh, fodder. This is a slide from that uh, presentation. I encourage you to uh, dig into that if you're interested. We did some forage analysis um, and looked at not only the trees we planted, but also trees that we found sort of naturalized, including some quote unquote invasive trees. All of them have really high nutritional value. All of them have a good role and, and can be really valuable ways to, to, I think, incentivize folks in riparian buffers to, to start to think about some of these trees we're planting and the ways they could, they could have multiple yields. They can be good for the water and also good for our livestock. And um, our gals just love chewing on whatever woody stuff we can give to them. And we have a breed of sheep called Katahdin, um, which are particularly great at both grazing grass as well as woody forages. Um, elder, elderberry uh, would be one of my top recommendations. Really easy to start, just like willow from a cutting. Essentially, I, I was just sticking cuttings today into some uh, soil mix. Um, and you can get these to root and grow really easily. Um, you do want to have selected cultivars. Uh, University of Missouri has a lot of great resources on elderberry, uh, as well as the River Hills uh, Co-op um, uh, based in, in the Midwest. Uh, you can order materials from them for selected varieties. Uh, we sell some of the selected varieties and we'll continue to expand that. Um, but do find those cultivars that are going to be productive for you if you're going to plant them. A lot of the um, state nurseries and things, the one will just be sort of a wild elderberry and it may not actually be, be all that productive for you. Um, and so we make uh, elderberry uh, juice every year, which is a really uh, nice medicinal sort of cold and flu kind of cough syrup sort of thing. And over the years, we've added in um, chokeberries or aronia as well as black currants, both which can work well in riparian areas and, and, and create a really nice balanced um, juice as well. It's both medicinal. It's also delicious if you want to mix it with a little, little gin or a little rum and have a little mixed drink at the end of the day. Um, really nice kind of elixir um, and easy to grow from these things like very, uh, very hardy uh, plants that can be worked into riparian uh, plantings. And then some of my other favorite trees, um, just to work in, uh, poplars and cottonwoods, really easy to grow again from cuttings. Um, they're clonal, and so you can get a, a, a patch established, and often you'll see new shoots coming up from the root system and actually forming these kind of patches. Cottonwood, of course, especially if you're in a drier zone, is one of the staple riparian species that does really well in both uh, high dry times and, and flood times. That can be really valuable. Sycamores really highly adaptable tree, um, really actually amazing fodder, I have learned. Uh, and you can even tap it if you wanted to. It does make a sap that you can actually boil down and, and it's quite it's quite like a butterscotch kind of kind of syrup um, if you wanted to go that route. Um, but phenomenal shade tree. And one of, you know, what I'm looking for in a changing climate are trees that, that grow everywhere. And so sycamore is found everywhere from Maine down to Florida. Uh, so all the way up and down the Eastern Eastern coast um, and far out into the into the Midwest, and um, yeah, you'll you'll find it. And then we have our alders and birches, which again grow ubiquitous in a lot of different ecosystem types. They're some of the oldest deciduous trees around. Their seeds will persist in the soil for upwards of forty years before they're ready to sprout and grow. And alders and birches can also yield certain things like fast growing mushroom logs, like material for for cultivation and. And things like that. So we're planning a lot of these um, in our buffers uh, for that kind of end in the future. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, kind of finally, um, we're not done. <laughs> our riparian work is just <clears throat> getting started, being twelve years in. Uh, it's not something that I think that you can just uh, like 
figure out overnight and solve overnight. I think it takes a lot of observation. It takes a lot of uh, trial and error. Um, <clears throat> even if you have, you know, professional engineers designing things, there's still going to be issues. Uh, um, so, so we're working with that lower Creek I mentioned now, and it is something that <clears throat> feels uh, beyond our own sort of experimentation uh, in terms of being able to solve what has become quite a serious channel to the point where some parts of this uh, stream are like six feet deep, like I can't see above the bank. And it's literally where our pasture is, a, is, a, is falling into the water. Um, and where you don't have, unfortunately, like a bank anymore, you, you don't really have an intact floodplain. It's, it's become so gully that it's sort of dysfunctional in, in those ways I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So, so really we needed to draw upon some, some other resources. And so <clears throat> what I wanna make sure folks are aware of is there's both federal and state programs and folks that can potentially help you out. And the reason I say potentially is because it all kind of depends on, on who your person or persons are in your area and, and where their interest is in, in buffer systems in agroforestry. And if they're on board and they're going to help you navigate the overly burdensome paperwork, I will say that honestly, um, and, and the process, it can be really worthwhile. But if you find that these folks, if you haven't met them yet, aren't, aren't sort of overwhelmingly helpful, it could be a real headache to access this funding. And I think it's a real unfortunate bottleneck that we see right now where um, sometimes it's because of folks' technical training or expertise. Sometimes it's the region you're in. Sometimes it's just who knows what, but um, you have these, these folks you're interacting with and you may or may not have a positive interaction with them. So, so take, it, take it all with a grain of salt. And if you have someone who's a real champion for you, then, then really pursue this. It's worth it um, in that sense. But the, the programs are, 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 I think, a little anti an antiquated and a, a little bit too complex, and, um, and they don't make it easy for the farmers. And I think that's a real issue that I hope someday will be addressed. I don't ever see any farm bill talking about improving this, this system of accessing funds. But there's a lot of funding out there, and it was just increased for climate smart farming practices, including agroforestry, including buffers. So the money is there. It's just a question of getting to that access. And so there's quite an established buffer program and this is what we're working with. We, we fortunately uh, recently had a new person come on who's really keen on agroforestry, really willing to help us navigate the system. So we're designing a buffer for that, utilizing their watershed specialists and, um, and helping us navigate through. And so what you have to understand with NRCS is they view, uh, um, issues on the landscape as resource concerns uh, and, and problems sort of to solve. So they have to identify those. So, uh, and, and then they have to uh, refer to a list of standards on how to solve those problems. And there's different programs and different ways to do that. Um, but uh, suffice to say, it's really worth getting, getting to know these. And so you can see some of the common uh, standards that are applied for riparian buffers would of course be a forest buffer standard, stream bank and shoreline protection standard, access control, fencing, prescribed grazing, pasture, and hay planting. So all these things have different species prescriptions, different payment options, um, and they can, so what we're looking at is a system where we get uh, the cost covered to uh, fence out a part of our riparian area, uh, pay for some of the planting that's going to happen in there, provide us uh, access, one of those stream crossings, because some of our pasture is, is not accessible. And what happens is you kind of put the plan together and then you throw it into the pool and it gets ranked. Uh, against other folks in, in your state. And then if you get selected for funding, then you can move forward over time. So I found that, you know, it always takes longer than you think. It's not something you're going to sign up for today and, and have happened this season. We're probably not going to be doing this riparian thing for at least a year at this point, right? But it's worth getting involved with the process and getting to know who's on your team, who's willing to go to bat for you, and if this can be a viable way. And so that's federal. And then on a state level, everybody has a soil and water conservation district, and often we know these folks as doing really good work to, you know, repair roads or install culverts, but they're also available for, depending on your state, again, in priorities and funding. In New York in particular, there's a lot of farm funding for water, uh, water management. There's an increase now in New York state for uh, climate smart farming management. And so especially the combination of managing for water and managing for uh, climate smart farming can really unlock some potential funds. Um, and, and be a really uh, good possible opportunity for you to get some funding because this stuff can be expensive to install. It's also really important because both these agencies, whether it's an NRCS agency or a soil and water conservation district, which again is a state agency, 
um, even though it has federal uh, linkages, they're they're run sort of through state programs. Um, you can you can uh, you can access some 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 different expertise as well, some some engineers and some things that on larger projects can be really critical to to success. So so you know, on our farms case, uh, we have found a lot of dead ends with our soil and water districts. We found a lot of uh, gateways open for us with with NRCS and. Um, either one of these could help us uh, produce a riparian buffer that that works with our goals and supports, you know, their goals and, and landscape goals, um, but ultimately depends on who's who's sitting at the table and, and interested in, in providing help. So, with that, a um, couple of resources for you all. There's a pretty widely cited conservation buffer guidebook um, that USDA and US Forest Service has put out. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the University of Missouri Agroforestry Center. This is a snippet from um, uh, one of their uh, buffer management guides. And then um, there's, uh, yeah, a lot of resources out there about um, uh, sort of managing the, the, the defining river corridors is an interesting one that talks about the meandering belts and things like that. Um, they're kind of littered throughout this presentation. So if you wanted to uh, review or write up or, or, or uh, what am I saying, diverse yourself in these things, um, do consult the slides as a way to, to find some of these links. And, and if you go for funding, um, the more you're educated uh, going in, like understanding these concepts, some of the things I mentioned about uh, Bankful and uh, the meander and things like that, um, you're going to have probably a more productive outcome. So it's worth uh, getting to know the language and, and some of the things if you're going to pursue that kind of, that kind of uh, support in your farming. So with that, there's my contact info, our, our farm website. Um, I see some great folks posting and giving some information in there, which is awesome. So thank you for that. And I will uh, happily answer some questions in, in the next few minutes before we wrap up. All right, so we're actually going to go over. I know we're supposed to finish at four, but if everybody's OK, Steve, if you're OK, hanging on there just for a few more minutes so we can answer some of these questions. Yeah, yeah. That would be great. Um, and I'm going to leave up uh, Steve's um, slide with his contact information so that you can write that down for a few minutes. So um, before we get um, going, I'm going to give Steve a couple of seconds to um, get himself ready and, and maybe take a drink or something because he's been talking a lot. I'm going to launch a poll. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, that'd be great. That really does help us with funding and um, that type of thing. So I'm going to leave that up for a few minutes. And I'm going to go ahead, Steve, and start with the first question for you <laughs> right yeah. at the top. So Rhonda asks, in our county, they debrushed all the waterways. Now we have horrible erosion. We put in a 100, I'm assuming, foot buffer through NRCS, but it is but it is grasses and not really doing a good job. The banks have slid terribly. The drainage board will not listen or, or dip the river so that our fields now flood. How do we get them to put back the trees? <laughs> well, that's a really phenomenal question. I don't know if you can convince, you know, there was enough hand wrangling to tell someone to put tre trees back in. I mean, unfortunately, <clears throat> it can be really common that folks are still resistant to that. I think the things I would recommend is there are now, um, you know, uh, USDA and NRCS guidelines for tree planting and agroforestry that are uh, quite uh, public and, um, and being put out there. And they're starting to really trickle down into the agencies. There's some resistance to that because this is often where folks have not uh, have have not developed any expertise, and so they get a bit nervous about <laughs> being told they need to focus on trees when they don't know much about them. Um, so you know that is one strategy though, is to sort of point point to their own materials. Um, there's an agroforestry strategic plan uh, sh that's showing up again and again and again. So there's ways to kind of point that out, but ultimately, um, you know, depending on your situation, the um, the buffer question is something, you know, these programs with NRCS are all voluntary. And so you can still pursue uh, your own projects um, outside, as long as you're not in a contract, you're not violating an existing contract. Um, there's no reason you can't put, put trees there if it's, if it's a landscape you're working with, uh, that you have title to and that sort of thing. So, so maybe it's looking uh, to uh, another institution, for instance, um, something like University of Missouri or the Savannah Institute, if you're in the Midwest or something like that to help you 
in the Southwest, there's a Kuvera coalition, which is really great. Um, so finding another agency that is on board and maybe can help, it would be what I'd recommend. All right. Thank you for that, Steve. All right, from Debbie, um, my a fellow North Carolinian, um, she says here in NC, rivers and, st and streams are bordered by swampy land. Well, in certain parts of NC, not everywhere, but um, how to best use that and make it more healthy for the water and decrease mosquito production? <laughs> oh man, great question. That is not my <laughs> realm of expertise. I don't know, Samantha, since you're in the state, have any <laughs> expert recommendations? I mean, these are these legacies sometimes are these are much larger ecosystems and we can we can change even in our lifetime so i don't i don't know that can be a tricky one yeah all right i, I don't have any help to all right. talk for any advice I, i'm not afraid to admit when i can't answer a question for good me. for you <laughs> i'm sorry about that debbie i do know that north carolina most of the counties in north carolina have a really solid uh soil and water so um if you want to reach out to them um uh, that I'm not sure where you are in North Carolina, but um, that might be a good place to start. I've had good luck with soil and water in North Carolina. All right, Penny says, any experience using grazing animals for invasive control in riparian zones? Is it appropriate to say use goats instead of a pesticide to manage weeds? And then how to mitigate the damage or contaminations the animals might do to the riparian area? Riparian. Yeah. That's a that's a great question and uh, an, I guess an irony that I didn't point out that I find is um, I visited a farm I was doing a class civil pasture class and helping these folks think through planning and they had put in a buffer through their NRCS and they were completely unallowed to put any animals into the buffer but they were allowed to spray excessive amounts of Roundup to control weeds and vegetation which to me is counterintuitive to uh, water quality and, and ecosystem health. Um, so that you can run into those those types of things, um, and again, really important to understand those uh, parameters if you're entering a contract, because um, it could not be worth it in the end if that's if that's the case, right? Um, what I'd say in terms of using animals is you want really low stocking rates and you want really short durations of time. If you're going to have them eat um, quote unquote invasives or really just undesirable plants, um, you, you probably in many cases need to, um, you know. Uh, I don't want to say starve them, but sort of stress them out a bit to the point where they're like eating something that, that may not be their preferred food if they're not going after it right away. So giving them a small area to, to graze in without a lot of other options will, will lead you there. But then you want to move them out pretty quickly, give them a chance to hit stuff and then and then move them out and give them some nice pasture or something else that, you know, will balance balance that out, I think is really important. And um, you know, the the last the other thing I'll say to that is uh we've had a lot of success in dry falls and in winters, I don't know where you are if you have a winter, but with bale grazing and sort of um, putting animals in and getting them to trample things down. And our sheep are great at, um, you know, they'll spend the first 20 minutes of the day eating hay, but then they're bored and they'll strip vegetation all day long just to look for anything green. So they don't really like multi-flora rows, for instance, but if we stick them in the right place in the winter and they don't have anything else to do, they will, they will start gnawing at it and that sort of thing. So, so winter bale grazing can be good. And if if you're adjacent to, uh, but not in uh, sort of that bank zone again, I think that's okay. But you really want to think about um, residual, uh, yeah, potential residual manure load and the type of effect that could have in, in any waterway. Um, so we were doing that on the edge of a wetland. Um, we're putting a lot of bales down. And so it's kind of balancing out, I think, the application of that natural manure. Uh, we're not ever doing this near like a fast flowing stream where that stuff's just going to wash, you know, wash away. So I think context really matters. All right. We actually, um, we could probably answer two more questions. Um, and Brian Hummel has got several questions in here. So I'm just going to choose one of his. Um, he asks, why uh, do you not make the burn and swale more gradual uh, where you can ride over, drive over them or mow them with a riding lawnmower? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. If uh, in our case, um, what we did to have access through the swales was really just to have breaks in the swale where we would put a culvert in so the water continued along contour, but then there was no berm. And so we could just drive right through. Um, it can be really tricky to have like, if you want to capture the amount of volume that we calculated that we wanted to, you'd have to have a really, really wide, thin um, 
a basin and then a really thin berm to be able to drive over comfortably. So in that case, it didn't work. I've seen on on more of a sort of gently sloped landscape where you can have, you can definitely have wider and sort of more gently sloping stuff that would allow you to drive over it. But in that case, it wouldn't have worked. So that's why, yeah. Um, I've got, I'm just gonna do one more question and I hate to do this to you guys because there's so many really good questions in here. Um, um, I'm was, gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead with Rhonda's about, um, about bushes that do not produce a large root, that do not produce the large root holes <laughs> and are not as apt to die and drop, but they won't allow us to put in trees in Indiana. Bushes would provide shade and not die as easily and would provide food plots for wildlife. Oh, actually, I probably, she was telling us that. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. That's interesting. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna do another question, sorry. Uh, Jenny asks, um, uh, this is when you were talking about the wild cherry um isn't doesn't she think that's do you better avoid the wild cherry because of the poisoning risk oh yeah the... sure. yeah and and um yeah i get this question a lot um also about like black locust and others willow even so i think um the important thing to understand wild cherry um when when it can be poisonous is when it's uh cut down and the leaves are fully wilted um there it's a cyanide that's produced and if animals eat that in excess they can have an issue but they really have to eat it quite a bit and it's the same actually with black locust um so people talk about that as a toxin and uh yeah if you eat a ton of it and aren't used to it you can get bloat or or something worse um because it's so high in in in, in protein um same with willow, there are tannins in there and you could technically overdo that and have issues um, with liver and things like that. So to me, what it comes down to is um, animals needing to be familiar with regulating their own grazing and browsing diet in the landscape. And I know FACT has done webinars with Fred Provenza. So you should just go watch those because that provides all the basis for this idea of animal familiarity with foods in the landscape and their ability to self-regulate. So a lot of those issues come down to animals that often are fed in confinement or fed a ration diet, and then they're suddenly out in the landscape and they, they sort of overdo it. Um, doesn't mean uh, to not uh, proceed with caution and, 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 and be aware of different ways that can show up. But um, our sheep, it was funny because when we started grazing, we, the first year we were out there with little hand pruners pruning out all these little wild cherry seedlings because we'd read in a book that they were like toxic. And then like we look over one day and we're like, wait, they're eating them. They like them. <laughs> like our sheep love wild cherry. They absolutely go crazy for it as a fodder. And so we had to kind of backtrack and realize that that was taken sort of out of context. So it doesn't mean it's not toxic, but but in the wrong place at the wrong time, it can be. Um, so know, we, we, did we learned that early on, but I would, I would encourage you to, to yeah, check out Fred's work and, and, and think through that a little more. On, on the so we we did have a really bad thing happen with um, some we have some really large um, wild cherry trees in the woods and it, we were always careful if whenever we have a storm or a hurricane that comes through to look for those yeah. branches that have come yeah. down but totally. what we had happen recently this was last summer we had a big storm come through and it just ripped all the leaves off of the trees and uh -huh. we lost like three lambs because of it. And we actually had yeah. to then just move them to a different pasture until it had time to, to get past that. But we didn't even think about the, just the in. there were so many leaves on the ground. Mm. The adult sheep were fine, yep. but the lambs, they were, you know, less than a week, couple of weeks old. Right, um, so concentration, the, they're, they're still learning from, from mom, right. right? They're not actually probably developing their rumens yet. They're not actually grazing. So that's why context really, it really matters. Matter. So not to say there isn't serious uh, potential issues, but but there's no list of good plants and bad plants, right? There's just understanding the nuances of, of those and certainly uh, keeping an eye on those 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 things that come up. So th yeah, thanks for sharing that as an example. Yeah, so I'm so sorry, guys, we cannot answer any more questions. I need to go to do our sort of finishing up stuff. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, Steve, if you wanted to look at those, um, something about sharing somebody's information, 
Um, anyway, so I, if you wouldn't mind answering those, I have a few housekeeping items to share before we sign off today. A recording for this webinar and the slides will be available soon. These documents will be archived on our website and Larissa will also email them to you all within a few days. We also have some other good webinars coming up over the next few months. Larissa will send links to all of our upcoming webinars and other opportunities for farmers and ranchers in her follow-up email as well. A sincere thank you to you, Steve, as always. You're always amazing. Um, it's been an honor and pleasure pleasure to have you and I'd like to give a special shout out to my colleague Larissa for everything she does to prepare for and follow up with our webinars. She is absolutely phenomenal. And finally, I would like to thank everybody out there in the audience for their interest and attention. I hope that you had a good experience today and we'll stay in touch and connect again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye for now.